Okay, great. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, it's always happy to be with comrades uh, to discuss difficult issues, complicated issues. Um, certainly, the question of uh, China is a very complicated issue and has been so uh, around the world, particularly now when we're in the midst of uh, what can only be described using a term that is uh, familiar for Latin America, but can only be described as experiencing a hybrid war conducted by the United States. This means a war on the fronts of diplomacy, finance, trade, and of course, information. Um, so I'm going to just present, you know, in about 40 minutes, a series of different, a range of issues actually, and hope we can have a rich discussion after that. Um, in the chat, I've put some references from which I'm drawing. Um, three of them are from the institute which I direct, which is Tricontinental, the Institute for Social Research. And then the fourth is the current issue of um, the journal Monthly Review, which I highly recommend. Um, it's a very, very um, informed uh, discussion in this issue, mainly from scholars based in China. It's an excellent text. So um, you got to start with the pandemic because we're in the middle of it. In December of 2019, doctors in Wuhan uh, identified something which they didn't understand. Uh, this is a very crucial thing that uh, nobody denies in the epidemiological medical community in Hubei province that the initial um, you know, uh, uh, patients that came in befuddled the doctors. Um, you know, China has an early, early warning system, but early warning systems only work when you can input data that's um, decipherable. You know, if you don't know what's going on, uh, you can't really use an early warning system. It, it's great to capture yesterday's diseases. You know, if you have an outbreak of, of something that's familiar, then the familiar symptoms and so on, uh, you know, the algorithm will easily figure out what's going on, etc. But here the doctors didn't understand and one or two of them began to raise the alarm. Now there's a suggestion that was made and is continuing to be made by the US government that there was a suppression of information. It looks to us like that's really not exactly what happened. And I'd like you to go and look at the text China and Corona shock, which my team and I produced, um, looking basically at the timeline of the first uh, reports of this new, um, disease and then the way it was reported. It's of course true that people are not uh, immediately, uh, you know, uh, going to report something because they need to be sure, you know, this is the boy cried wolf scenario. Um, and also as we go on up the chain, you'll see that the WHO is very skittish about declaring public health emergencies and a pandemic. At any rate, in uh, toward the end of December, a couple of doctors quite um, vigorously made the case that this is something very urgent, very serious, has to be looked at. And interestingly, on New Year's Eve of 2019, the head of China CDC calls the head of US CDC Redfield and says, look, there's something we don't understand. And um, by the way, the context of their phone call was reported in the New York Times. So it's not, you know, um, something in the subterranean media, it's something in the corporate media as well. Um, this was on the 31st of December. Um, United States didn't really do anything uh, for a long, long period of time. Alex Azar, for instance, is on record. That's the US Health and Human Services Secretary is on record uh, of saying that through the month of January, he minimized things to Trump because he didn't want to upset him and so on. I mean, he's on record saying that. Um, on the 20th of January, 2020, it was confirmed that this particular virus uh, can be transmitted from human to human, at which point um, the Chinese government, provincial government in Hubei province, and then the national government in Beijing shut down Wuhan city and eventually Hubei province. At the time, as you know, China was accused of being authoritarian for doing that, but they shut it down completely. And um, they, when they did that on the 20th of January, uh, this provided enough evidence as well for the World Health Organization. On the 30th of January, they declared a public health emergency. Uh, it always takes the WHO time 
to declare a pandemic because a pandemic has to be more than in one country. And eventually on the 11th of March, uh, they declare a pandemic. Um, meanwhile, the Chinese government is able to break the chain of infection. Uh, just to give you a statistic, there have been about, you know, just under 5,000 deaths in China from COVID-19. 5,000 deaths in China, COVID-19. You know, in the United States, there's 115,000 deaths. Um, and the United States had months to prepare for uh, the virus to enter the US, mainly from Italy, uh, but also you know, from cruise ships and so on. The US has had months to prepare, but it didn't prepare. And I think that's something I'm going to address in a minute in order for us to try to understand China. Um, the Chinese shut down Hubei province, relatively broke the chain of infection. There have been cases of either somebody coming from overseas and bringing uh, the infection back or some community transmission, um, but they've been able to contain and largely break the chain of infection. This has not happened in any of the major capitalist countries, India, Brazil, European countries, and of course, catastrophically in the United States. As I said, over a million people infected, uh, 215 people uh, known to have died from um, COVID-19. Now, the second text I shared with you is called Coronavirus and Socialism. What my team and I looked at is we looked at Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Vietnam, uh, and Kerala, the Indian state of Kerala, and compared those to uh, the major capitalist countries. And we tried to understand why is it, for instance, why is it that last week there were more cases of COVID-19 in the US White House than they were in Vietnam, in all of Vietnam. Why? Vietnam shares a long border with China, a land border. Um, there's a lot of trade and movement of people across that border. Laos, a country of 7 million, shares a land border with China. Virtually uh, no cases compared to the 7 million people. And until and, and now, I think almost still no deaths uh, when I last looked a few days ago. Um, it, it's incredible. I mean, these very poor socialist countries have had the ability to contain the virus. How is that possible? You know, how is it possible that the world's richest country uh, had to accept half a million uh, pieces of protective equipment from Vietnam sent to the United States? I mean, this is Vietnam, which was ruthlessly bombed by the United States, um, you know, in that war using chemical weapons, Agent Orange, napalm, and so on. Uh, after that, Vietnam, this poor country, its agriculture destroyed for generations by US bombardment, sends half a million pieces of, um, of uh, protective equipment to the United States. I mean, you know, how is that possible that the US cannot produce its own protective equipment? So we looked at this carefully and, and we, cre we said there are four analytic ways, four categories to help distinguish the approaches of these two different kinds of uh, projects, the capitalist project and the socialist project. Uh, one of them was that in the socialist governments, uh, they had a science attitude towards the virus. You know, they listened carefully to what the World Health Organization was saying, and they said, look, we have to first uh, test people. We have to, if there's an outbreak, do contact tracing. Um, we have to use protective equipment. We have to use masks. We have to use hand sanitizer, whatever the WHO's most current findings were on this virus, we have to follow it. And we have to do this in a very planned and effective, you know, very systematic way. So in early January, in the state of Kerala, for instance, which is in the Indian Union, the health minister, KK Shailja, immediately created a task force because she knew students from Kerala were studying in Wuhan. Now, you may not know this, but Hubei province is one of the centers of Chinese industry. And you know, a large number of students go to study high tech and computer science and so on. So she said she knew that there were Indian students from Kerala in Hubei province. So she immediately set up a task force. They started to test people at the airport. Um, you know, they started to do contact tracing. They developed an app on phones to be able to monitor um, you know the movement of the of the disease and so on, just so that they could. To, could have, and so that was a scientific approach to the disease, very different from Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi, and others who had a kind of religious hallucinatory attitude toward the virus. So that's the first difference. Second difference is in most of these countries, there's uh, the governments 
have put some effort into building up the public sector. Even countries of great poverty and lack of, of, of financial uh, you know, um, uh, you know, resources and so on, they, they had tried to protect the public sector. And this is the public sector in two ways. One is many of them had tried to protect public health care systems. So public health care systems hadn't been destroyed. You know, this includes um, barefoot doctor type things that you have in, in, in India, in Kerala, that you have in, in Vietnam, uh, that of course you have in Cuba. In Cuba, 29,000 medical students went off and tested 11 million Cuban citizens. I mean, it's incredible what happened. In countries like the United States, the state did nothing. I mean, it didn't come, the, the public health infrastructure has been destroyed. Public health workers did not go door to door to test people, to check on people, to do temperature checks and so on. So that's the first aspect of public sector, which had continued to be harnessed. And in China, of course, you saw the public sector ramp up production. And in our document, we have the statistics for this. Not only did the healthcare system kick in, and I, I'd like to make a point here, but when in Hubei province, the epicenter of, of the coronavirus, when um, doctors began to worry up for their own health. The Communist Party of China gave a call saying those doctors who are Communist Party members are encouraged to substitute themselves for doctors in Hubei province who are not Communist Party members. And some of the new hospitals they built at rapid record speed were staffed by Communist Party doctors and nurses. And you may notice that when one of the hospitals closed down, there was a little video that circulated on Instagram and TikTok and so on of the doctors and nurses standing in a line on a stair and they each removed their mask. If you look carefully, they each had a Communist Party membership button um, because they were the communist doctors and nurses that went in and substituted for doctors who were not uh, were scared about a very dangerous situation of healing. So the public health infrastructure in these countries, especially in China, has not been as battered. Now, China had uh, seen a decline in, in state expenditure towards uh, public health, but it's not the kind of neoliberal cuts that you've seen across Europe and the United States. And as a consequence of this pandemic, the government has decided to ramp up spending to build up public health infrastructure again. The second form of public sector that's important is in the production side. You see, you don't have to rely on for-profit companies to create masks and protective equipment and, and things like that. You can just direct public sector undertakings to produce masks and protective clothing. And that's how Vietnam was able to send half a million protective equipment to the United States because they still have a public sector that is able to, you know, of course, pub look, we all know public sector enterprises are not always going to be able to, in a capitalist way, compete against private sector firms because private sector firms are run on the basis of profit. They are leaner often. They have no social, generally no social, uh, you know, direction to their work. Um, and they basically uh, can produce things with enormous negative externalities. You know, they can, uh, uh, they would like to dump their, their trash you know, on, on public lands and let the government pick up the tab for it. Public sector firms are in a bind because they have to have some sort of social mandate and so on. So they can't just function or be compared on the basis of the law of value to private sector firms. It's, we're talking about apples and oranges, but in the middle of a crisis, the, the validity of having a public sector uh, undertaking is absolutely essential because they were able to kick in and produce goods which the private sector in the capitalist countries simply didn't because they felt either that their supply chains were not capable, they, they had created production along such extensive supply chains to benefit uh, profit taking, but not to benefit pivoting to new things that needed to be produced. You know, so much for just-in-time production, uh, the great, uh, you know, uh, thing that the Japanese had pioneered. It didn't kick in for, for this kind of stuff, you know, not even for hand sanitizer. There, it was like, you know, uh, the Titanic trying to, to move in the water, a very slow move moving, whereas the public sector moved fast in these countries. It's very important. The fourth thing we found was that in many of these countries, there's a dynamic society that kicked in. Public action was very important. In China, uh, it's funny, you know, the, the Western stereotype is that uh, 
well, with China, it's double. It's racist and anti-communist. There's an idea of a sort of a great oriental despotism. You know, there's a small Xi Jinping and maybe a small group of people around him dominating the whole of Chinese society. That's the oriental despotism, racist idea. And then there's the anti-communist idea, which the, the, the vision that they have of communism is that the government controls everything and there's no society. In fact, it's not true. Uh, China is one of the most decentralized and organized societies that you'll find. And, you know, my God, Cuba, the committee to defend the revolution, you know, everywhere you go, there are people organized into different groups doing all kinds of self-help, mutual aid, and so on. In China, there are neighborhood committees, you know, which kicked in when the pandemic struck. Um, neighborhood committees were doing temperature checks at the entry point at neighborhoods. They were getting medicines to the elderly, making sure people were getting food and so on. They took up the room that the state didn't have to do. The state didn't have to actually do everything. It's ironic that in the advanced capitalist countries, the people just wait for the state to act. I mean, talk about authoritarian. I mean, social civil society has been absorbed by, it's been commodified by NGOs, uh, by for-profit type entities as well. You know, um, entities that provide contract service to the state. I'm thinking of for mental health and so on. These are essentially for-profit entities that uh, contract out state functions. Uh, you know, society in many parts of the advanced industrial country has been commodified. And you just don't have the capacity for public action that you see in places like Vietnam, in China, um, certainly in Cuba, in Venezuela and so on, where people just came out in groups prepared and organized. In Kerala, this small state in, in India, uh, the trade union movement, for instance, appeared and built sinks to wash hands at bus stations. Um, the cooperative movement, Kudumbushri, millions of women, four and a half million organized into this cooperative. To, it's a producer's cooperative. Stop making pickles and other things, other edibles, and began to make masks. I mean, they just pivoted their production as a cooperative and produce masks and hand sanitizer and other things like that. So the third aspect is public action. You know, you see it in these societies um, and you have to wonder why, because they haven't commodified public life uh, in, the, in the way it's commodified in the advanced industrial states. And the fourth thing was internationalism. You're not going to find, um, you know, in, in uh, let's say, uh, during the Ebola crisis. I mean, what did you find? You found um, Cuban doctors in West Africa. I was traveling on a train in Morocco a few years ago, and I met a team of Chinese doctors um, who had been there for years. They were dealing with women's health and other issues. That was their, their, their mission. Every province in China sends a set of medical teams abroad. Uh, as a provincial task of its international duty. In China, there was no jingoism about the, you know, this uh, coronavirus. There, there was no jingoism. They took an internationalist attitude, uh, so much so that at the last China-Africa forum, uh, Xi Jinping and, uh, you know, said that China was going to send ventilators and a huge amount of medical supplies uh, onto the African continent. Uh, not for money, but because it's part of the internationalist duty. It's not something that you see from the advanced industrial countries where instead it was jingoism, vaccine nationalism, racism that characterized the toxicity of culture, of political culture, you know, where Trump at the worst uh, talking about the China virus, Kung flu, you know, racist kind of things. It's the toxicity of political culture. Um, not that we expect to see you know, US doctors going in teams to assist people around the world. You don't expect that, even though it's one of the richest countries. Uh, you just don't expect to see that. Uh, you expect Cuban doctors in the Henry Re Brigade, which is why they deserve the Nobel Prize. Uh, so the fourth aspect is internationalism. It characterizes these societies. I want to make that very clear. So the first thing is China was able, through public action, through the public sector, through science attitude, and to some extent through internationalism, was able to break the chain of the virus. Uh, of course, there's still great vigilance because you don't know there can be a you know another breakout somewhere, and there was a breakout, and they tested millions of people in days um, because they take this seriously. I mean, people have to be before profit. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, uh, coming out of the pandemic, 
Now, look, uh, the IMF had its meeting last week and they released the main report in which they suggested, and please note this down, next year, the growth pro prognosis for the world economy is very weak. It's very weak uh, global growth. Whatever growth they are able to estimate, they say 60.4% of global growth in 2021 is going to come from China. So China will contribute almost two thirds, 60.4% uh, of global growth will come from China. I just want you to think about that. that that's incredible. I mean, <laughs> China will contribute 60% of the growth that we will see next year. Um, how are they able to do that? Uh, what, what's going on? I'm going to spend some time talking about that, but we need to think about how are they able to do that. Um, I want to spend some time talking about the pivot that, or the, at least the long history of China, and I want to break it up into some periods. I mean, I, I hope this is all relatively useful to you. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I didn't want to start with the question, comrades, is China socialist or has it restored capitalism? Because to me, that's a boring question. Uh, that's a question that assumes that human history is somehow, um, you know, it's easy to move from capitalism to socialism. You know, we know, as Engel said, that um, the struggle is in zigs and zags. Uh, we know that. We know that it's extraordinarily difficult to build socialism uh, in a country, uh, even a country as large as, as China. Uh, we saw that in the experiment in the USSR, how hard it was to build socialism, um, how many problems the USSR faced uh, with stagnation in the economy, um, diversion of, of, of uh, social wealth towards you know, um, the military and so on, uh, attempts at reform failing. Uh, we know that it's a real challenge. It's not easy. We also know that from 1917 on, the great October Revolution on, every single socialist revolution has taken place in a poor country and in a peasant country, including the revolution in the Tsarist Empire. It's a poor country. There's never been a revolution in the capitalist world. There was no revolution in Germany, no revolution in Britain, no revolution in France, no revolution in the United States. Uh, these countries have had no revolution. And you know, bizarrely, most of the great critics of socialist experiments that are largely in the third world, most of the great critics are all sitting in these countries which never made a revolution. They never made a revolution, but they have the wherewithal, of course, to point fingers and say, your revolutionary experiment is falling short. And I just want to put that out there because I want to say that given that these revolutions um, drawing great inspiration from the um, breakthrough, theoretical breakthroughs and the praxis, uh, the experience of praxis that was put forward by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, um, these revolutions didn't wait for history. You know, They seized the opportunity, went forward. First revolution against the Tsarist Empire, we know 1917. Then in Mongolia uh, was the second revolution. Um, uh, you know, following that, let's say Vietnam, 1945, and then the attempt to smash that revolution. 1949, China, 1959, Cuba. I mean, just look at the trajectory. These are revolutions in poor peasant societies, which were immediately penalized for their revolutions. I mean, look at Cuba, still faces six decades of blockade, never given a break by the imperialists. Uh, when Trotsky was sitting in Istanbul and writing his fabulous history of the Russian Revolution, uh, he writes toward the end of that book, he said, you know, capitalism has had hundreds of years to fail. You didn't even give us a few years. The day after we had a revolution, you said we are a failure. You know, the day uh, Salvador Allende won the election in 1970, the United States government tried to overthrow him. Uh, by the way, it's a plug. I have a new book called Washington Bullets, uh, in which I tell that story that, you know, it's not true that the coup against Allende took place in 1973. The coup against Allende starts the day he won that election. Uh, it goes from 1970 to 1973. It's a three-year coup d'etat. A coup d'etat doesn't just happen in a day. It's a process. And that's what they did to Allende. Same thing with Chavez. When Chavez won the election in 98, the coup begins then. They've been trying to overthrow that government, not from 2017, not from 2014, 
from 1998, they've been trying to overthrow the Bolivarian pro uh, process. In Russia, you had the revolution and the white army invades almost instantaneously. Um, Cuba, the blockade comes immediately. Vietnam, 1945, Ho Chi Minh and his comrades declare independent Vietnam and they are immediately attacked by the French. Uh, they just helped defeat the Japanese, but then the French attacked them and then the United States, a vicious, nasty, unforgettable war prosecuted against the Vietnamese people. So uh, what, what I'm saying is that when we judge um, an experiment, a socialist experiment, we have to look at it with a certain attitude. We have to understand it for what it is. Firstly, it takes place in a poor country, a country with few resources, uh, where the human capacity has been diminished by colonialism and semi-colonial conditions. Um, you know, think about the opium wars prosecuted against China, um, the dumping of opium onto that population, the destruction of the human capacity. Think about the Second World War, which doesn't begin in 1939. Um, in, 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 in Europe, the Second World War begins in 1937 when the Japanese invade China. And then from 1937, that war goes to 1949 with tens of millions of people killed in China. Agriculture disrupted, even in some parts of the country destroyed. Um, so think about where revolutions happen and what they are supposed to do the day after you win? How will you construct socialism when you have poverty around you, when the human capacity has been diminished by imperialism? You know, how do you build socialism? I mean, think about that. Uh, I would like all the critics of third world socialism to just pause, take a deep breath and think about that before they so quickly have a litmus test to say this doesn't match up to our abstract theory, uh, what we learned from our abstractions about what socialism should look like. So I would like that to be there. Secondly, from 1949 to 1978, the first phase of, of China's history, um, there were enormous errors made by, you know, the government at all levels, enormous errors made because they were trying to zigzag a process. How do you, again, produce um, the human capacity, that was their first major interest. It wasn't to build up the productive forces. The first interest is how do you secure the human capacity, education, health, um, you know, uh, um, you know the, uh, hunger, how do you abolish hunger and so on. I want you to think about something. If you compare China, revolution succeeds October 1st, 1949, and India, British leave on the fifth, well, let's say they leave on the 15th of August, 1947, or India declares independence. It's about the same period, two years apart. In fact, India two years ahead of China uh, in this. Um, same population, 1.3, 1.4 billion, 100 million give or take between the two countries. Um, in, from 1949 to the present, if you look at the social indicators in China and India, there is no comparison. I mean, in China, um, the question of hunger is nothing compared to India, uh, where we feel that about half, uh, sorry, uh, more than just, just above half the Indian population struggles with extreme hunger. Uh, about 700 million people, maybe, uh, maybe even higher in the pandemic, struggle from extreme hunger. This is not a situation in China. Um, you know, in fact, uh, in this last period, the last 30 odd years, we've seen uh, poverty being uh, extraordinarily diminished in China. About 850 million people brought out of poverty. I mean, this is a number that the Chinese government have, that the World Bank has, um, that the IMF accepts. I mean, nobody has disputed this figure of 850 million people brought out of poverty. I mean, there is something incredible in how the human capacity was improved from 1949 onward. And the comparison must not be with the United States of America, where remember in 1945, not one attack took place on its territory. Its loss of life was much less than the loss of life in the USSR and in China. Um, you know, the human capacity in the United States was not diminished, in fact, in, improved uh, by during and after World War II. Um, so you can't compare US uh, poverty rates or whatever with China, because that's just not a good comparison. You've got to compare, let's say, China to India. It's, a, it's actually the best comparison. India today continues to struggle with hunger, continues to struggle with ill health, 
continues to struggle with illiteracy. In China, it's quite the opposite. So that's the first thing. From 1949 to around the reform of 1978, you saw an enormous emphasis placed on these three things, hung, the diminishing of hunger, um, healthcare, and on, a, on education. And they experimented with many ways of trying to solve these three crises, these pressing crises for their civilization. Um, and some of them worked, some didn't. I mean, barefoot doctors was an incredible idea. It was such a good idea that at Alma Ata, in the WHO meeting, in the Alma Ata declaration, which I highly recommend you go and read from 1978, I believe, uh, they directly, uh, you know, um, praise the Chinese experiment with barefoot doctors saying we need to create public health apparatus for rural areas that is going to touch every person in a society. You can't just build a big hospital in a city and say that we are dealing with healthcare. You have to have somebody who goes and touches every single hamlet in every single village and asks people, what are your ailments and so on. And I think that's something um, really that's quite extraordinary. And one has to go and look at that. So that's the first thing. It's true that there were cuts in healthcare spending in the last period. That's true. And the Chinese government says it is true. And they are saying now we are going to improve spending. But that doesn't obviate the fact that from uh, at least the 50s onward, there was this attempt to improve the human capacity in China in terms of health, education, and nutrition. These three things, you know, in my opinion, if you're a socialist and you're not as a priority trying to end hunger, I don't know what kind of socialist you are because that has to be a priority for a socialist. You've got to end hunger. Um, that's a huge issue. You know, place like India, it's a pressing issue. I, I was looking at statistics in the United States. It's incredible to see the hunger rates go up. Um, it's a scandal. You should, nobody should go to bed hungry at night. Um, not even one person on the planet. Okay, so in 1978, um, I think it's important to see and to say that in the Chinese, um, uh, you know, uh, intellectuals and leadership and so on were looking at what was happening in the USSR in the 1970s, watching stagnation in the economy, uh, somehow difficulty pivoting. Uh, into a reform era that was not going to be revisionist kind of reform, but would be able to improve the um, productive capacity of firms, um, you know, provide new kinds of incentives. I mean, this is the kind of thing that the Chinese were looking at, uh, which Che Guevara had looked at in 59, 60, when he in Algiers made his speech about how we should not have incentives in our socialist experiments that entirely replicate the law of value and material incentives. Are there other kinds of incentives we can create and so on? This is something that Che Guevara was very uh, much uh, seized by in 59, 60, 61, um, all the way to 1965. I think the Algiers speech is in 1965. Um, the Chinese in the 1970s were watching the Soviet Union. They were concerned that um, the Soviets were not capable or not having an easy time uh, pivoting the economy into some dynamism. Uh, but now we must remember that uh, it was an experiment in central planning that took place at a time when the biggest computers had less computing capacity than most of your smartphones. Um, you know, I mean, they were working initially with pen and paper, then with card machines, and then eventually with computers that just simply were not fast enough to be able to manage the level of information you need to properly plan an economy. Um, anyway, the Chinese looked at that and said, no, this is a problem. From um, the 1970s to the late 1980s, uh, Chinese intellectuals who were close to the leadership and so on were looking carefully as well at the question of technology. Um, they felt that there were leapfrogs taking place in productive capacity, uh, particularly computer technology and so on, and they didn't want to somehow sit out of that because they saw enormous human potential um, in computerization, uh, in more effective ways of producing things. Um, after all, if your productivity increases uh, and you have a socialist system, then you can use the productivity gains to benefit society. You don't use the productivity gains to uh, have just the accumulation of capital. That, that means you can increase uh, leisure time, decrease the working day and so on. You know, productivity gains are not something to sniff at. They are a good thing because then you can increase leisure. Um, you know, in, if you have a socialist uh, order, proper socialist order. So in in this instance, um, what you see is uh, you have debates breaking out. How do we 
uh, you know, create new technology and so on. And the Chinese government puts a lot of emphasis on higher education. And it's here that we need to understand the nature of the Chinese reform agenda. Because again, I want to compare India and China, because again, there is a value to that. I, I see the Chinese reform era doesn't, it doesn't happen in 78. Again, this is not a correct way. It opens in 78 and runs through till the early 1990s. Um, you know, when Deng Xiaoping has this very famous meeting with um, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the premier of Singapore in the early uh, 1990s, you know, when uh, Shenzhen is, is, is set up and so on, that reform period, it takes time from, that takes this long decade from 78 till the early 1990s to set up most of the infrastructure for this pivot. Um, and then you see a real pivot taking place. Well, what's very interesting is when you look at the IMF, International Monetary Fund uh, approach to the most of the third world, the IMF came in after the debt crisis in the early 1980s and said to countries, look, you can um, you know, get funding and, and we'll arrange even commercial funding for you. Uh, we'll arrange portfolio finance for your, your country and all that stuff, but you have to structurally adjust your economy. Um, you have to cut healthcare, cut this, cut that, and then we'll, we'll allow the money to come in. That was known as the structural adjustment program. Um, and you've got to increase foreign direct investment, you've got to attract foreign companies and so on. Most places like India basically went to foreign company and said, you know, um, we want you to come and the foreign company said, well, here's our agreement. And the Indian government signed the agreement. They didn't actually negotiate much. They just accepted whatever terms. That's interesting because a few years ago, I read the files of the South Commission, which was run by Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. And the Chinese delegates to the South Commission, I wrote a book about it. It's called The Poorer Nations, um, A Possible History of the Global South. You, you, you're welcome to go and read it. There's a chapter um, on the South Commission deliberations where the Chinese team in that commission made it very clear that the reform agenda that they were interested in pursuing wasn't a reform agenda that was a capitulation to foreign capital or a capitulation to international finance institutions. They made simple arguments. They said, look, we need to bring technology and science into China, the most advanced technology and science, and we need to develop our own capacity. That's why they said we need science, not just technology, because technology is only today's, um, you know, uh, it has only value for today. Science has a value for the next three or four generations, because the point is you don't want to just bring a piece of technology into your country and say, oh, we've got this technology. If you have the scientific capacity, you can make the next generation of technology. You're not reliant on continuing to try to bring technology in. You want to start innovating. And for that, you need to develop your scientific capacity. So the Chinese started to do that in the 1980s in a very concerted, deliberate way. They also told foreign capital, if you want to come into Shenzhen, take advantage of uh, working class in China. That's the bargain that we're going to set in a long-term way. If you're going to do that, you have to turn over to us um, the technology and science behind, let's say, for instance, um, the manufacturing of, of um, solar power, you know, of uh, solar you know, uh, arrays and so on. You have to show us how you do it, and you have to tell us the science behind it. And these French and other companies, because they were so eager for to take advantage of the arbitrage, the lower wage rates of Chinese workers, that they gave up their technology and their science as well. And now, of course, Chinese firms are the world's leaders in the production of, of solar arrays and, and wind farms and things like that. This is technology they not only... Uh, you know, absorb, but also they've started producing their own kinds of, of, of technological innovations, which are leapfrogging ahead of the European companies. These European companies keep taking China to the WTO, and they keep finding that their cases don't have um, much, you know, a standing because there are these contracts that they signed. I mean, they were not compelled to do it. They decided we would prefer to be in Shenzhen than in Indonesia. Well, the Indonesians were not asking for um, the turnover of, of technology and science, but the Chinese were. This is a long-term game they played. Certainly, it meant that the Chinese working class for one generation sacrificed uh, a great deal in order for this uh, transformation to take place. And I don't think we should underestimate the sacrifices of the Chinese working class. I mean, and it was not a big political sacrifice. Um, this is the sacrifice that they conducted, I think, 
there was no big political thing that we have to do this in order for the future. But I'm, I could be wrong. Um, I would like to be wrong about that. Um, anyway, so by um, the time we get to the financial crisis of 2008 uh, and, and, and thereabouts, 2007, 2008, um, China already has has begun not only to be the workshop of the world. You know, I don't have time to get into the supply chain and so on, but China is the workshop of the world for low, um, you know, uh, value-added uh, products. You know, all your your things that are available in Walmart in the household goods section. You know, plastic goods and and even refrigerators and things. Those are relatively low value um, added. But also in electronics, you start seeing Chinese things in more and more uh, electronics um, and not just uh, Chinese putting together electronics, but innovating. And I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so that, that's a huge uh, advance that takes place. But there's something else that's going on. Um, when that financial crisis takes place, world financial crisis, there's a great realization in China at many levels of society um, that reliance on Western markets uh, is suicidal uh, because the Western model is not sustainable. Uh, it is a model that is based for its consumer um, ability on debt financing. And because wages aren't going up for workers in the main, and because unemployment is going to be structural and increasing, um, this debt fueled uh, consumption is going to rely on China recycling its surplus to provide credit uh, to American consumers, for instance, so that they can go into debt to buy Chinese products. This is what, at that time, uh, the IMF, in a marginal comment, called a satanic circle. The Chinese realized this and tried to break that satanic circle. And here I'll make just a few uh, points. Um, I want to raise three or four issues here uh, in how to break the satanic circle. Um, firstly, uh, the, the, this is the period in about 2013 when uh, Xi Jinping uh, you know, and his team and others say that we need to focus attention on high rates of poverty in China, particularly in rural areas. Um, so the first and second point are related. One is the anti-poverty program and related to that is which, which will come in 2017 is a rural revitalization scheme. Um, these two things are important because there was a recognition uh, of the, uh, the the immensity of poverty that was there, you know, in 2013, and but listen, this poverty alleviation thing was on the one side a moral issue, that uh, you know they said by 2020 we're going to eradicate poverty in China. Uh, they made a statement. In fact, uh, just I think last week, Xi Jinping reiterated that said despite the pandemic we're going to do our best to make sure that you know whatever it is, some 20,000 people a second are lifted from poverty or some it's some incredible number. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but he reiterated that recently. It's not only a moral issue, which it is, um, it's also an economic issue because if you can um, transfer wealth, if you can create a mechanism for transfer payments to the poor inside China, you'll create a domestic market for your goods. So you're not, you don't have to rely on the Western market to buy your goods. It also means you make different kinds of things. I mean, no country in the world can buy the kind of refrigerators that are uh, sold in the US market. You know, the giant refrigerators for suburban houses with multiple doors and ice machines and things. Most houses, the kitchen is about half the size of the refrigerator. So, you know, they have to retool their production lines and produce different kinds of things, smaller cars, smaller refrigerators, in a sense, much more eco-friendly anyway. So poverty alleviation was on the one side moral. And as I said, 850 million people brought out of poverty. That's incredible. Uh, but also it has to do with lifting up the capacity of people to absorb um, you know, the economic production that's taking place. And this is one reason why the IMF is assuming, is estimating that 60% of world growth will be in China, because um, even if the supply chains are relatively broken and they're not really that damaged in this pandemic, even if they are broken, um, there's an internal market. So the, the first thing is the internal market. And that comes through one, Poverty alleviation schemes go back to 2013. And secondly, rural re revitalization, which starts in 2017. Uh, put these together and you've got the bulk of 
um, the entire poverty alleviation uh, scheme, which has really got a huge rural fo focus uh, to give transfer payments to people so they can start improving their, lively, uh, their lives and so on. Um, so that's a big part of the contemporary agenda um, of the Xi government. One, one way to pivot away from Western reliance. Second, not just within China, but outside China. And therefore in 2013, um, the government starts the One Belt, One Road program, uh, which was to move from, you know, let's say the uh, entire Eastern seaboard, uh, which is, you know, uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen and all that from there, all the way out to Europe, down into the African continent, of course, down into Southern Asia and into Latin America. I mean, this was an incredibly ambitious project uh, to increase communications, transportation and technology and, and communications, firstly, across Eurasia. Um, so to build train and, and, and road lines uh, across the southern flank of, of Eurasia from, again, uh, let's say from Shanghai, all the way out to Lake Van in Turkey, across Lake Van to Istanbul and then into Europe, um, and then down south into Myanmar, and then down south into Pakistan. Then there was the string of pearls, which would be the ports that were being built in Hambantota in Sri Lanka, the port of Gwadar in Pakistan and so on. I mean, there was the string of pearls, which is the oceanic route um, to build connections with countries uh, to increase commercial relations with the global south, not only with Europe and the United States. It was in this that One Belt, One Road becomes a Belt and Road Initiative. Um, out of this comes the CELAC uh, China Forum. That's the one in South America. Out of this comes the Africa China Forum, uh, which is the forum which just met recently again. Um, and these platforms were a way, including um, the um, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, these platforms are a way for China to build new connections, political, but also economic and commercial connections in the global south. So not relying on Western markets. That was the second great pivot outside the world financial crisis. Um, the third thing in, that's uh, directly linked here is the shift in Chinese production uh, as a consequence of um, that science and technology focus to high tech and very high tech. So firms like Huawei and um, ZTE and so on um, begin to make telecommunications equipment like the 5G and so on that are far ahead of Western companies. Some of this is because in the United States, for instance, um, in 1996, there was a new telecommunication act pushed by the Clintons, uh, which hampers the ability of the telecommunications sector uh, to invest in the next generation of development. They're all trying to create to hold on to their markets and so on. That has an impact. It also was because Nokia uh, was knocked off the stage. Um, its own business decisions were not great, not the greatest decisions. But what we see in the same period is within China, whether it's 5G, whether it's all kinds of artificial intelligence, internet of all things and so on, um, there are enormous advances to the extent that they may be leapfrogging Western tech companies by one or two generations. Baidu is one of them. And then certainly their, their own GPS system, which they've devised. Um, some of this information is in that, um, in the uh, uh, chat I put, it's the red alert we produced from Tricontinental called the US imposed hybrid war on China. It's red alert number nine. And in this, we make the argument that the US trade war against China, this is a point that's also made um, in the monthly review text um, uh, called Towards Delinking um, by Lau Kin Chin and others and her colleagues, um, and also made in US tra China trade war. Um, Xi Ming Long and colleagues, uh, these two essays also make the same similar point, which is that China's uh, shift to high tech. Uh, is a great threat to Silicon Valley, and which is why the United States is using every means possible uh, to derail them, but not using commercial means, but political means. In other words, the advantages of imperialism to smash, um, you know, uh, both uh, Huawei and ZTE and so on. I mean, why not just compete with them in the open market? You know, when Pompeo makes statements saying that 
uh, you know, Huawei is going to turn over your data to the Chinese government. I mean, this beggars belief because he's saying that he's saying it hypothetically. They may do that, but we already know from Snowden, Edward Snowden's revelations, that American tech companies turn over date your private data to the National Security Agency. You already know that. Uh, but that somehow is not a problem. And, and you know, here we have, let, let's just face it, there's a little bit of racism at work here. And it's it's easy, it's a cheap form of racism. You're more worried about the Chinese state than the American state. I mean, that's crazy. Um, you know, Chomsky uh, says the most dangerous force on the earth is, well, the Republican party, he says, but really it's the American state. Um, you know, uh, how many wars has the United States prosecuted around the world? What does the NSA do? I mean, they're probably tape. Well, they'll probably have metadata on this webinar and have all kinds of information that they've collected and so on. All your questions you'll ask, and you know, they monitor everything. Uh, you know, and 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 I'm I'm not sure even what they do half the time with the data, unless they weaponize it to come and grab you and throw you on a plane and whisk you off to some black site somewhere. Um, I mean, seriously, uh, we are to believe the the outrage of Mike Pompeo about that. And then of course the outrage by this administration about the policy toward the Uyghurs. Um, you know, this is an administration which follows the Obama administration, which followed, you know, the Bush administration where they had actual black sites, where they actually tortured mainly Muslims. Um, th th these black sites were in not only Guantanamo, but in Eastern Europe, they used the prisons in Egypt. They had their own black sites in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in, in Abu Ghraib. I mean, seriously, like, I mean, I'm supposed to accept what Mike Pompeo is telling me as the great champion of the Chinese Muslims? Please, I, I'm not, I, I'm not so gullible, um, you know. And, and I'm happy to talk about Xinjiang, but I'm not going to take my um, my lead from Mike Pompeo, uh, neither on. Uh, Huawei nor on, on Xinjiang, because I mean, that's ridiculous. And and I'm actually puzzled how people use information that comes to them from Jamestown and these other, you know, basically dump sites of American intelligence as if it's all factual. Uh, it's extraordinary. Let's not forget that it was, a, uh, it was the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter who was rolled in front of the United States uh, Senate, I believe, to give testimony saying Saddam Hussein's troops were throwing babies out of, um, out of uh, you know the uh, the you know these medical devices and uh, were you know killing children to take these devices back to Iraq it turned out it was all false that uh, she was trained by a, a PR group in DC which was probably paid by Gulf Arab states maybe the CIA and so on I mean come on guys let's let's have some fidelity to uh, the way in which information moves and not fall into the hybrid war so quickly. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we, you have to deny reality, but certainly be prepared to try to understand things in a slightly deeper way. Okay, just a few minutes more. Um, these attempts by the Chinese government uh, to pivot away from the West has actually uh, zigzagged again back to the idea that perhaps the development path since 1978 once again needs to be considered. I mean, this is what's interesting about the post-78 period. It's hard to categorize it as one thing. You know, I, I, I found that book about the restoration of capitalism in China that came out, you know, years ago, and I, I've forgotten the author's name. It was just too wooden because you don't see that, that there is a, a way in which the, um, the people of China on the one side, and because there is immense protest from the people. I mean, public action is, is, a, is a fundamental thing in Chinese society. And there are crackdowns and so on, but there is public action. But also inside the Communist Party, there are a range of opinions, range of opinions. And every once in a while you see these debates appear. It, they were there when Hu Jintao was the, the premier. They are there with Xi Jinping. The question of, no, wait, we need to pause because we, this move to increase the productive forces, it's having an impact on inequality. It's not helping with poverty alleviation. And then you see the zigzag go this way. So once again, um, you know, in a few years ago, Xi Jinping gave a, a lecture about the importance of returning to Marxism. Uh, you know, uh, this lecture was recently released to the media. Uh, very interesting that it was released recently. Uh, 
big moves again about we need to uh, get rid of poverty, we need to eradicate poverty, um, uh, you know, enormous uh, a try a development of, of a sense that uh, we need to, you know, push socialist policies rather than the policies that help develop productive forces, which will enhance our socialism, but which also can create values that are not good for a socialist society. So you see these zigzags, you see these debates, and I'm going to end with this, which is that I'm I, I discomforted by the idea that um, there's just one opinion in, in China, uh, you know, or maybe there's two. There's one government opinion and then there's dissidents. I mean, that's nuts. Um, within Chinese intellectual society, there are a range of opinions and there are arguments and debates. Um, these are debates broad philosophical fundamental issues. These are debates on practical policy issues and so on. There's a lot of debate in that society. I'm involved with a, a project called New, No Cold War. Uh, on the 24th of October, I, I welcome you to a conversation being held between one of the most uh, important Chinese intellectuals, Zhang Weiwei, is going to be in conversation with Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University. Uh, they're going to talk about the No Cold War. And you know, you'll hear things from Zhang Weiwei that will be of interest because you know, he needs to be uh, listened to outside China. But how many Chinese intellectuals does one hear in you know the media or anywhere? Um, you know, we we did a earlier a webinar where we had um, Victor Gao, who was the um, the translator of Deng Xiaoping uh, when Kissinger and Nixon came. Uh, Victor Gao has very interesting things to say. He, he was fascinating. Before that, we had Wang Wen, who uh, Wang Wen was the um, Global Times opinion editor and is now the um, dean of the Chongyang Institute of Financial Studies. Um, so there are many voices inside that country, you know, so let's not try to flatten this is China, that is China. Let's look at the debates as well within the country, because it's from the debates that we learn, um, you know, how they are trying in from a situation of poverty in 1949 uh, to produce um, this project of socialism with its zigzags, its errors, its, its you know, its, its uh, its defeats, uh, its encouragement, its victories, and so on. So uh, it's always zigzag to socialism, comrade. There is no straight road. You don't wake up one day and say, oh, capitalism is gone and now we're socialists. It just doesn't work like that. It's a long, long journey. And the Chinese understand that. And they don't plan five years, they plan 100 years. And you know, I'll see you in 100 years and we'll see what their civilization is like. Um, thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Um, and we're opening the floor for discussion. Thank you again. Um, in order to introduce your question or um, make a comment, you need to click the picture of the hand, click the raised hand icon to indicate you want to speak. Again, we will not be able to read uh, questions in the um, question box, so please uh, and for those of you who were, who, uh, were not able to, uh, to reach, uh, BJ has agreed to do a class for us on uh, uh, modern imperialism, modern socialism. So we will uh, have an opportunity to engage with him again. So I'm looking for raised hands to open mics. Lo, uh, your mic is open. Open your mic when you are in. Lo, go on. Very. Can you hear me? Yes, concisely, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, you you touched on. Thank you, VJ, for this excellent presentation. Um, the question I have, you touched on Chinese internationalism and the IMF. I wonder specifically about South Africa and the recent IMF loan that's been really debated within the ruling alliance. I'm wondering, do you have any information on why China didn't offer such a loan to South Africa instead? Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> that's actually a question for the South African government, um, which, you know, is a government that, if uh, you know, has its own issues. Let's put it like that. Um, 
just recently, as I as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, I suppose it was in June. There was the um, China Africa. Uh, you know, it was called the Extraordinary China Africa Summit on Solidarity Against the COVID-19 Pandemic. I don't, I don't know if you followed that, that uh, whole summit that was held. It, it was very important. Um, at the summit, uh, many countries, including Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, the president of South Africa, um, he is the chair of the African Union. Um, and in that uh, presentation that Ramaphosa made, he said that, you know, the African continent needs supplies and so on. And, and Xi Jinping at that conference says, we'll, we'll provide the supplies. And then he said, as a member of the G20, the group of 20, which has agreed, at the time had agreed um, to basically debt relief. Um, he said China will basically give debt relief on interest-free loans and so on. There'll be no payback uh, necessary till, well, when we see how things go. Um, the Chinese have had an interesting uh, situation with this because look um, you know that in the uh, in the western world there are two kinds of lenders there are commercial lenders and then there's the um, the official money like it's whether it's overseas international aid or it's a government form of loan and so on one is through the state and the other is through the private sector but the china china also has government aid and then private sector money um, which and the private sector money is well hello it's controlled by the private sector so um, you know the export import bank of china is a sort of public private kind of situation so at that meeting in june i was interested to hear xi jinping say that he will instruct the export import bank and the other forgotten the name of the other bank he'll ex instruct them to offer good terms and to provide debt relief and so on uh, the Chinese also have money to, to lend. Uh, why did uh, Ramaphosa's government go first and queue up at the IMF? I, the answer has to be inside the South African government. You're asking me a question that cannot be answered. Um, wh why should the Chinese offer money like that? You know, they decided to go to the IMF. Um, why didn't they first, even at the forum in June, say, you know, put on the table not debt relief, but new money. Um, last week at the IMF uh, meetings, uh, very interesting to hear the managing director of the IMF, Georgieva, and the chief economist at the World Bank, Carol Reinhardt, interesting to tell them, that, hear them say that even developing countries should take more debt on. Uh, you know, uh, Reinhardt said that when you're in the middle of fighting a war against this disease, don't worry about the money. You can worry about paying it back later. By the way, you can worry about paying it back later. What about the money due now? Why don't you just forgive the debt? Um, you know, that would be very helpful and useful. But no, they're saying take more debt. But what they mean is take it from the Paris and London club. They don't mean take it from the Chinese. Um, and there is a reason why... Uh, Ramaphosa went to uh, the international financial institutions controlled by the Western Bloc, uh, but I don't know the answer to that. Okay, Trent, I'm opening your mic. Open your mic on your end, Trent. Hello, am I coming through? Yes, you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, Hi, Dr. Prashad. I just wanted to ask, uh, given uh, coronavirus and having the BJP in power, how are Indian communists interacting with the uh, INC lately? Thank you. <laughs> it's a little off topic, but uh, that's okay. It's, uh, it's a world I know uh, because that's my world. And the... Um, you know, the BJP came to power in 2014. That's a couple of years before Donald Trump won the election. Um, and the BJP comes to power on the back of a really vicious right-wing movement uh, grounded in a fascistic organization called the RSS. And Modi uh, appealed to the business sector saying that he was going to produce labor market reform, which basically means the end of trade unionism and so on. And he was able to sell a bag of tricks to the public, you know, comes uh, with a, you know, 
very well paid uh, you know the in the, that election in 2014 uh, was the most expensive election in the world ever seen even more expensive than donald trump's election in 2016 uh, it's incredible how much money was spent and over 80% of the money spent was spent by the bjp the far right party um, they bought that election i mean they also have very great reservoirs of support, but they spent a lot of money to buy the election. And the re-election also was incredibly, ex ex incredibly expensive. The problem with the Indian National Congress, which is the party of, you know, what used to be social democracy, um, you know, used to be a kind of national uh, freedom struggle party vehicle. The problem with parties like the Congress in India or even the African National Congress is that their economic policy is basically the IMF's economic policy. Uh, previously, I was asked, why did Ramaphosa go to the IMF? Well, because, you know, think about the people who run the economic policy in an ANC government. Um, they are basically predisposed, people like Peter Manuel, predisposed to the IMF, Narmila Sitaraman in the BJP, predisposed to the IMF, but so is the Congress party. Um, they are the ones who led India into so-called liberalization in 1991, uh, in July 91. It was not the BJP, it was the Congress. So um, the Congress has right-wing views on economics and is a very difficult uh, organization to ally with um, because you know, uh, they want to utilize your base. Uh, you know, they are not, it's, it's this idea of a United Front or even a popular, well, popular front or a United Front, it's a very fraught and complicated idea and a complicated argument. Um, you know, it's the same issue in the United States uh, where the Democratic Party essentially is a party of the liberal capitalist bloc. And I understand it. I understand, you know, you can go back and polish up uh, Dimitrov. And, and I know Gary Bono is on this call. Uh, he and I did a re-edition of Togliati's lectures on fascism, which I highly recommend from international publishers. Um, you know, Gary and I are doing a new book uh, called Vivi Ramos on the sanctions attack against Venezuela from international publishers should be out in a few weeks. I highly recommend you look at it. It's an incredible edited book. It's called Vivi Ramos, We Will Live, uh, Voices on the US Hybrid War Against Venezuela. The subtitle of the book is Venezuela Versus Hybrid War. Highly recommend it, guys. Seriously, it's going to be a great book. But you know, we can dust off our Dimitrov and our Togliati and so on, and we can make all kinds of arguments for the need for alliance with the liberal bourgeoisie against the far right. Um, yes, that's all fine. On the other hand, um, clarity in the base is extraordinarily important. And so therefore, alliances are hard. The other thing is that we always assume that the left is the one who doesn't want to ally uh, with these other forces. In fact, it's the other way around. Let us be clear. It wasn't Rosa Luxemburg who attacked uh, you know, Friedrich Ebert. It's the government of Friedrich Ebert the social democrats that murdered Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, uh, you know, it was Friedrich Ebert uh, that sent out the shock troops to kill the communists. Um, so it's not always the case that, well, the left is not willing to ally with the liberal bourgeoisie against the right. The liberal bourgeoisie hates us as much as the right hates us on most days. Uh, so it's very complicated uh, tactically to create space you know to build movements and so on and in india I, I would say that the communist movement has done an exemplary job in this last period in attempting to build mass movements and particularly in the pandemic uh, to build mass movements against the attack on livelihood and the attack on labor rights and in some of these struggles you just don't see the congress you just don't see them this is where the left leads independently and you know it's where it's our job. We are the standard bearers of the working class and the peasantry. And we don't expect uh, the liberal bourgeoisie to join us in these things. Okay, Diane, your mic is open. Your hand is up, your mic is open. Please speak. Oh, sorry. I have it that it's down. But okay. I, you have a but question? 
Well, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank him very much for his, um, the whole story about China. I've been reading a lot of history on China lately, and this really helps put it all in focus. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a moment. Looking for raised hands, looking for raised hands. It takes a minute because there are Raina, your mic is open. Raina, your mic is open. Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for you taking the time to do this. Uh, it's very informative. Uh, I was wondering what advice do you have to us communists here in America to combat the constant barrage of lies and slander against China. Um, I noticed like with the, the Muslim stuff, when you really look into it, a lot of that goes back to a source named Adrian Zenz, who's a far right, far right wing um, fascist who believes he is led by God uh, to combat communism and all this stuff. And I've even noticed in uh, so-called leftist publications, they, they allow these articles to be published and they'll have titles like, well, you know, it's not always imperialist propaganda, what's going on in China and this and that, but it's, um, it's very alarming to see right-wing Trump talking points make it into leftist publications. How can we better uh, combat that and what advice do you have? Thank you. So, I mean, I'm glad you, you mentioned that name of that gentleman Zenz, because that's the, when I said the Jamestown stuff, that, that, that article was in Jamestown. Um, you know what's amazing about the writing is that the pictures that are there are even falsely captioned. Uh, so they're real pictures of Chinese medical workers in Xinjiang, but they will take like a health check and make it into forced sterilization. Um, so some colleagues and I are looking at the data, health statistics in Xinjiang and in in other uh, areas, you know, around Xinjiang. And I mean, it, it, there's like, I mean, when you look at um, the Kyrgyz Autonomous Area and you look at the data from there, uh, I mean, if you unless you contest the official data, um, which nobody seems to do. Um, the, the numbers they have are all bogus. Like, you know, he, he says that, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm just looking at my notes so that I'm not wrong about it uh, because I think these things are, are, are fairly precise. Well, we need to be fairly precise about them. Um, he makes, Zenz makes an argument um, where he says that, uh, yeah, Xinjiang, he says, accounted for 80% of uh, IUD placements. But the actual number is 8.7%. You know, IUDs is a birth control device. Um, I mean, it just gets away with saying anything. And there, there used to be a convention that on North Korea, journalists used to say this, on North Korea, you can say anything. You can say anything about North Korea and nobody is going to check your facts. You can say anything. You can say that the, you know, the leader is has been checked into a mental asylum. and that's going to be published everywhere. Um, it's becoming similar with, with China. You can just say anything, it doesn't matter. Um, Pompeo can say anything and people report it like fact. Uh, that's extraordinary. I mean, there, are, there is an issue that we need to look at carefully. You know, in, in uh, well, I'm talking about my book now, but in Washington Bullets, when I was researching it, I found a document, very interesting document from 1951. And uh, it's a document where a Chinese Muslim who is in Taiwan uh, writes a letter to the US government, a report actually, um, in which he says, you know, um, here it is. Uh, his name is Haji Yusuf Chang and it's 1951. It's called Proposal to Unite Democratic Nations and Islamic World into an Anti-Communist Front. And he has a three point agenda, he says, we need to set up an Islamic cultural society in the place chosen as the center of the Muslim movement, a channel keeping close contact with Muslims in the world. Second, 
Publish periodic pamphlets in English, Chinese, Arabic, Urdu, and Malay languages. Third, um, the, we have to, um, both the cultural society in the office issuing the pamphlets should be headed by Muslims, either from China or any other Muslim country. It is of the utmost importance that it should not be made known to outsiders that such services are backed by the United States. That's in 1951. <laughs> and you know, we know that the World Muslim League set up by the Saudis in 1964 um, essentially was propaganda inside the Soviet Union to create dissension among Soviet Muslims who were uh, Soviet citizens who were Muslims uh, to feel that communism was against them. And it's a similar kind of thing. But it's also the case that, um, you know, there have been uh, groups the East Tata fighting front or whatever it's called. I mean, I, I've seen them in Turkey, you know, they came in to fight in Syria um, and they are highly radicalized. You know, they, they are very much like the uh, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and so on. Uh, these are highly radicalized groups. And it was some of these groups that did the attacks in Urumqi, uh, which really alarmed the Chinese government. Um, so uh, three, four things are happening in Xinjiang simultaneously. One is there's, poverty alleviation. Uh, and it is true that as a consequence of a thousand years of Chinese history and development, the so-called minority populations are a disadvantage. So poverty alleviation is linked to, you know, minority advancement, let's call it that. And then there is this whole thing about what to do about radicalization uh, in this belt of Al-Qaeda. And that's part of, of what they are having to deal with. Now, are they doing things in a way that's perfect? I'm not sure because you know, uh, even what one reads is 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 complicated. And you know, I, I'm working with a team of people uh, to try to better understand how to understand some of these uh, you know these places of of whatever it is re-education. Um, you know, uh, how to understand what's happening there. Uh, because certainly there is an issue. I mean, th there are camps of some kind, and there is an issue that they are facing, uh, which is, you know, these explosions in Urumqi certainly did alarm the government. Uh, are they going about it in a perfect way? I'm not sure. Uh, let's go and have a look at it. But I'm not going to, again, take my talking points from Adrian Lenz and Mike Pompeo and these people, you know. Again, since when did they become credible interlocutors about Muslim freedom? Okay, Scott, your mic is open. Open your mic when you're in. There you are. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay. Hey, Vijay. Good seeing you, man. <laughs> it's been a long time. Wanted to say hello. Um, uh, a quick question. Um, every time I was in China, the discussion in the party um, was broadly characterized between those who took sort of a stiff approach to how to change things and those who wanted to, um, you know, experiment with more um, ideas from the West and stuff like that. There were, there were the, that kind of debate. But, um, but it's been a long time, so I don't know what the current debates are. And it, it would be interesting uh, for me to see. And I just wanted to raise one other point. Um, you know, I'm real active in the labor movement, and of course, um, the, the government here uh, has tried to convince workers that the Chinese are stealing their jobs and all of that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I think uh, is incredibly important, and I've, I've used this in discussions and it's moved people, there are over a hundred large corporation, U.S. corporations in China taking advantage of the Chinese uh, system, and they are the ones that um, you know have have moved. You know, General Motors, General Electric, Ford, uh, and on and on and on. They're the ones that move production out of this country there, not the Chinese government. So anyway, I think that's an important point to make. And the last thing is that uh, along with the, some of the things you were saying about context, I always like to make this point too. This is the first time in the history of the world that we have the total resources to be able to take care of everybody on this planet. Uh, we could provide everybody with education, everybody with food, everybody with housing, everybody with things they need. And I think that's an important prerequisite for uh, moving towards socialism too. That's it. Thank you. Scott Marshall, 
uh, nice to hear your voice. Um, I just want to say that on your last point in, I think in November, uh, Noam Chomsky is joining us at the, I, I'm going to be in conversation with him at the Bombay Literary Festival. And we'll talk about his new book, Inks, Ic Internationalism or Extinction. And it's it's really quite interesting because he makes that point, Scott, about, I mean, th there is just a moral challenge to people that we live in a time, as you quite rightly say, when hunger should be extinct and yet hunger is increasing. Um, you know, the human population is being made extinct rather than hunger and illiteracy and so on. And this is a moral question that young people need to contend with. Um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not even a political question. It's below that. It's a moral question. Uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, what kind of planet do you want to live on? And you have to ask yourself, um, are you prepared to allow uh, the capitalist system to destroy everything we know um, you know, in order for uh, its own religion, which is the religion of private property, uh, of hierarchy and privilege and so on. So uh, you, the point you make is a very important point and it's a, it's a moral challenge that, uh, you know, for people coming up, for younger people, I think. Um, you know, I think uh, older people have had to grapple with this already and, um, you know, uh, people like you have, have settled accounts with this question in your youth. Uh, it's not like you need to grapple with it now, but we haven't been able to win the battle of ideas in our generations. Uh, but the generations that come must have this, this battle of ideas debate again, that, you know, what kind of moral uh, stamp do you want to place uh, on the world? So th that's one thing. Secondly, of course, I agree with you that, um, you know, uh, it's not only U.S. companies, it's companies from all over the world that uh, made the deal, made the bargain after 1978. Uh, it's called labor arbitra you know, global labor arbitrage. They said wages are lower and also the workers are more disciplined and, and educated and they have health. You know, this idea that Trump and Pompeo are pushing of shifting production lines out of China, it's not so easy. You can't start production in India uh, in the same way because workers get sick more often because they have less nutrition intake, they have malnutrition, there's more disease in society, they're less educated. Uh, remember those human capacities that the Chinese communist uh, revolution was able to, to some extent fulfill of taking care of health, um, nutrition and education, that has an impact in, in the ability of in, in productivity. Um, you know, if your workers keep getting sick, if they haven't eaten enough, um, if they're not educated sufficiently, they can't be as productive. So it's very hard to pivot out car manufacturing from Hubei province, you know, where Volkswagen produces cars. That's the epicenter of, as far as we know, of the coronavirus. It's hard to move that to, you know, Allahabad in India. It's not easy to do that. Worker isn't the same as a worker. You know, uh, we have to look at the whole history of, of a person's abilities and so on. So yeah, these, you know, Western companies, not only Western companies um, have taken advantage of high quality and lower wage workers in China. And now, well, you know, these are the contradictions. Uh, you have to pay the price because now Chinese manufacturing is leapfrogged over you. And rather than come to terms with that, um, you want to just bomb China into submission and say, go back to just being the workshop of the world. How dare you produce high tech and, and challenge us on the world system, uh, we, which is effectively the nature of this imperialist imposed trade war. Uh, it's basically saying, you know, you, you, you cannot be allowed uh, to step out and, and say we are producing things. It's just not permitted. Um, so, th so that's, that's that. Um, uh, I think is that I forgot to note down the first point that Scott made, but uh, I, it skipped my mind. I got so caught up with the last thing he said that well, the initial. Well, move on to yeah. the next. Can we take one more question. Okay, please. Yeah. Okay, Shelby, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Ah, just a second. I remember it because oh, I put it in the chat. It's about the different schools of contending thought in China. And I put in the chat a lecture given by En Fu Chen, who's a very important Chinese intellectual, was uh, in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. This is a lecture he gave in Kerala about a, just a little under a decade ago 
about the seven contending schools of thought in China, and it's still actually quite appropriate to read it because not that much has changed. So, Scott, I, I put it in the chat. It's a PDF from uh, the theoretical journal of the Communist Party of India, Marxist. Um, and Fu Chen came as a guest in Kerala, and he gave this incredible speech. So, yeah, sorry, I forgot that. Take a look at it. Uh, sorry, uh, Didi, yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, very, very good talk, and it has ex ex inspired me to uh, to look into this more. But this this is my question specifically: um, the U.S. Uh, ruling elite in this country hate the idea that anybody would challenge their leadership in the world. Period. And um, with the USSR, what they did was. Uh, you know, force the arms race upon them. And I'm thinking, or my question is, how do you think China will deal with, with that, with the U.S. spending so much more money uh, towards armaments and the military? Uh, what will that mean for them in terms of trying to do the things that they want to do, such as bringing the people out of poverty and building society? and uh, all the other positive things you talked about. Will they also be forced to join this arms race? So, I mean, one of the important things for us is that, you know, uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party has learned a lot of lessons from the experience of the USSR, a lot of lessons. And I think we also need to learn some of these lessons. Uh, one of the lessons was that, um, the USSR did put uh, a considerable amount of social wealth into its military. And what the Chinese are doing is the general idea is to protect the sovereignty of China. So the military capacity being produced is not so much an aggressive capacity as it is a totally defensive capacity. So, you know, the Dongfeng missile that they tested recently off the coast of Taiwan has the capacity of knocking out a U.S. warship uh, in the South China Sea. Because what they're saying is we don't want the Americans to challenge our littoral, our, uh, our coastal waters. And, you know, th there are issues that Vietnam, Philippines, and so on are contesting some of the islands and so on. These are not easy debates. I mean, the, our comrades in Vietnam have a serious problem with uh, the way in which um, the waters are being treated in the South China Sea. You know, there, there are long old disputes going on there. Um, but the Chinese general attitude is that we will defend our borders. And that's the important thing. Um, Fascinatingly, Harvard University ran a big opinion study of China, which showed that there was some 85% uh, positive rating among basically middle class people, because that's who is polled uh, for the Communist Party, um, because people value stability over instability. They see what happened to the USSR when the party uh, collapsed, essentially, in 1991, 92, and you saw the piracy of the country and the destruction of standards and the destruction of social institutions and so on. Um, people are not willing to go through that. So there's a lot of internal support for the government. Uh, there, it's not going to be easy to do a color revolution inside China. Very hard to do it. And, and that's part of the reason for the frustration of US policy, You know, the push towards um, this kind of hybrid war that Pompeo, Trump, and you know, I, I, I'll say it, friends, that Biden will pursue as well. Uh, I, I don't see much difference on on this issue between the two flanks of, of, uh, of the political class. Um, you know, I, I don't see a liberal, uh, and, and uh, John Bellamy Foster in the monthly review essay, opening essay makes this point. Uh, we don't see any tech firms coming out and saying this attack on Huawei is outrageous. No US tech firms. Uh, there is no liberal, um, you know, uh, defense of China uh, in the mainstream. Everybody's just piling it on. And so on the one side, there is, uh, uh, this idea we will create a military force to defend our borders. On the other side, there is considerable amount of support inside China for the government. It's very, it will be hard to have a color revolution in, in, inside the country. And thirdly, the Chinese have been insistent that their interest is in multipolarity and in building relations with countries outside uh, China, uh, very firm and fundamental relations. And recently, 
their diplomats have started attacking American policies. Um, you know, this is called the wolf warrior syndrome, where these wolf is named after a Chinese hit Chinese film. These wolf warrior diplomats are coming out in public and saying, no, Pompeo is lying about X, Y, Z. Um, you know, they defend Venezuela publicly. Uh, they defend the Palestinians publicly. They defend Iran publicly. They say, we will trade with Iran. We will trade with Venezuela and so on. I mean, this is a very interesting development. Um, you know, they are trying to create momentum. Uh, and I think they are going to have a hard time because the cultural industries, um, the media houses around the world take their orders still from the US State Department. Um, it's going to be hard to change that. You know, it's not just CNN and, and Fox News and so on. It's newspapers in India, in, you know, the African continent and so on. They take the running orders on foreign news coverage basically from um, the u.s state department and that is going to have to change you know that's why i use the phrase it's fidel castro's phrase it's a battle of ideas about some of these issues so the chinese are aware that they cannot outspend the americans on military force it's not just about the military it's also a battle of ideas um, that have to be conducted directly and by the way it's after the Soviet Union collapse that Castro began to routinely make speeches about the importance of the battle of ideas. Um, he said that that is a singular front that we fully neglected in the previous period. We didn't contest um, the imperialist narrative about things. We sort of let it go and we pretended that we have our own you know, stories that we tell over here. We didn't contest them frontally and we have to. I mean. Scott's point earlier is a frontal contestation of the values of the system. You know, uh, you, you, you're so rich, you can't feed people. I mean, what kind of country are you? Uh, why don't we talk in those basic ways? You know, why do we get into the intricacies of what's the this program for child support and that program? We need to confront them directly at the root of where their wretchedness lies. And the root of their wretchedness is that they would prefer to defend property over the lives of people. You know, it's, it's the old communist slogan, people before profits. You know, but we need to now drive this uh, to people in a way where it is utterly morally clear, you know, what do you prefer? A society of people who are hungry or a society of people who are smiling? Okay, VJ, on behalf of everyone, we'd like to thank you for your, for the time you spent with us uh, today. We'd like to extend two invitations. One, for you to come back and discuss the book that will be soon released by international publishers give us about two weeks or three weeks after it's released and we'd uh, very much welcome uh, a uh, class where we discuss that book and then the other thing to which you agreed uh, which is uh, a, uh, a class series on uh, imperialism uh, modern imperialism and modern socialism so on behalf of everyone we extreme this is a wonderful way for us to spend our sunday we thank you we thank you we thank you see you okay bye bye good day good afternoon good evening wherever you are see ya